has been opened. After the Dr. Keller, do you mind if I open the discussion to Dr. Edwards for a moment? I would like to take... Conceivably. <laughs> I would like to... Uh... No, I've got a question for you, Dr. Edwards. Dr. Teller's major point tonight has been the subject of the, of the energy crisis. Mm -hmm. He has said that the energy crisis can drive us into the kind of depression that destroys democracy and produces dictators. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you are measuring, as I understand them, the danger of nuclear radiation or nuclear accidents against that danger, he feels that danger is worse and that there is really no other answer but to go ahead of nuclear energy. What, is, what do you say to that? I say that it's a very desperate move. Uh, Howard, Senator Howard Baker, for example, says there's a risk, it's probably the greatest risk that any civilization has ever taken. I don't think it's worth the risk. First of all, the energy crisis is a phony crisis. It's largely a, it was largely a refinery crisis in the United States which could have been foreseen. The real way to tackle the energy crisis is to look at energy wastage. Energy has been doubling every 10 years. One of the reasons we have an energy crisis, I would say, is because of nuclear power, and I'm not the only one to say this, because the nuclear scientists have been telling us, promising us for decades, that there's unlimited energy right around the corner. Therefore, don't skint. Don't just use all the energy you want. And as a result, we've had preferential rates for large uses of energy. In the States, they use aluminum to make beer cans, which are used once and thrown away. Aluminum takes seven times the energy to smelt. So instead of passing laws, regulating planned obsolescence, regulating the throwaway society, regulating the use of energy-intensive materials when other materials could have been used instead, improving the insulation of homes, improving the efficiency of air conditioners. It has been shown in recent studies, one of them by the Science Council of Canada, that if they instituted conservation measures starting now, they could save as much energy between now and 1990 as nuclear energy would produce in that period of time. Dr. Edwards, I'm going to interrupt you. Uh, I know both you gentlemen have a lot more to say, but I'm going to bring our audience into it because they have a lot to say, too. We'll be back with our audience and our two debaters in a moment. You are watching The Great Debate from Toronto. Our subject resolved that nuclear power plants are necessary and should be constructed. Our debaters, Dr. Edward Teller for the affirmative, Dr. Gordon Edwards for the negative, and our chairman, Pierre Burton. And it's time to go to our audience. The gentleman in the front row has a question. Would you stand up, sir? <coughs> Uh, Dr. Stiller, uh, at the beginning of, of the program tonight, there was mention that uh, the Americans, where you come from, do need uh, nuclear reactors. But uh, we Canadians have enough energy not, not to need it, have need of it. Now, I'd like to ask you, both of you, to comment on that question. Why do Canadians need nuclear reactors when they got lots of energy, is the question, I think, Dr. Teller. They don't. They have constructed what is, in my opinion, the world's best reactor, the Kandu reactor. Least dangerous, it has the great advantage that it can run with little uranium, won't deplete resources, can be run on natural uranium and on thorium, your export of these reactors can help England, can help Europe, can help other countries. I wish the energy crisis were not real. America cannot be isolationist. Canada can be even less isolationist. And because you don't feel the pinch, the storm will get you. Dr. Edwards, any comment? Before yes, I'd like to comment, first of all, that uh, by pushing the Kandu reactor, Canada is promising to export concentrated energy in the form of heavy water. They're going to supply all the heavy water. They've had trouble supplying their own reactors with heavy water. It takes an enormous amount of electricity to make heavy water that are used in the Kandu reactors. And nobody has ever taken that into account in terms of figuring out how much energy it actually produces. But in the States, as late as 1970, the Atomic, Energy Commission of Canada, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission of the United States was the largest user of energy. They consumed 10 times as much energy as all their atomic power plants consumed. The American military has been gobbling up huge heaps of energy. In their Vietnam War, they've just, just used incredible amounts of energy. Now they've got an energy crisis. My dear, we have to look out for the poor underdeveloped countries and the poor people who can't heat their homes. They have the most wasteful society which has ever existed on the face of the earth. 
And I think this has become very dramatically clear in the last 10 or 20 years. And now they're talking about energy crisis and portraying it as if all we need is more energy. Just give us more energy. I say that energy consumption right now is not correlating with the quality of life. It's correlating with garbage, pollution, exhaustion of resources, and devastation. Dr. Teller. Again. Dr. Edwards is right. Or more accurately, half right. <laughs> we have produced too much garbage. We must save energy. It is true we in the United States use one third <coughs> of the world's energy. But in 1950, we used almost one half. The energy increase was correlated with the re-establishment of good life in Europe, in Japan. In the future, it is connected with the development of the developing countries, which if it does not come, then we are lost. We must save and we must also produce more energy. You in Canada, for others, we, partly for others, partly for ourselves. But one last point. That heavy water requires so much energy is quantitatively wrong. But there are new ways to produce heavy water more cheaply with lasers. And this is one <laughs> of the most important research projects that I am urging on my colleagues so that heavy water should not only be effective, but also cheap. And you need it for the Kandu reactor. Right, let's go back to our audience. Uh, gentleman up there, would you stand up, sir? Some years ago, Dr. Teller, you were flying around over Carlsbad, New Mexico. And they were exploding an underground explosion, 2.7 kilotons. Way down under, it shouldn't have gotten out. As the explosion came through the surface, you said there are some surprises. Isn't it possible that there could be some surprises with your storage of nuclear wastes in salt mines? Yes. Niels Bohr defined an expert as a man who through his own painful experience found out all the mistakes that one can commit in a very narrow field. I would like to make... I am not an expert. I haven't made all the mistakes. I have made most of the mistakes. And there are some things that are safer, some things that are less safe. To fiddle with the energy crisis is unsafe. To work with nuclear energy has become, as human endeavors go, Quite safe. Dr. Edwards? First of all, I think the scientist in his laboratory for the last 300 years has become rather arrogant because he's been working alone, taking all kinds of chances, exploring the unknown, always exposing himself to risk, always facing the possibility of blowing himself up in his lab with him. And I think that this is very deeply ingrained in the scientific mentality. Now they're using the world as their laboratory. They're trying the experiments on a very large scale indeed. <laughs> 20,000 years. I was just over at the China exhibit and I saw some fantastic relics dating back 5,000 years. I wonder what people 5,000 years from now are going to think when all they can find are radioactive garbage dumps which still have to be guarded because if they ever get out... Well, we've made the point in radioactive dangerous. garbage, I think, and now okay, we'll go fine. back to our audience. Uh, can I please say I? that this radioactive garbage has good uses? And in 5,000 years, this radioactive garbage will be used safely and effectively, and it will not be called garbage. All right, just gentlemen up there, we just have this. Yes, Dr. Edwards, I'm sure we would all agree that fire has been a great boon to mankind. Yet in all the times that, that man has used this source of energy, we have not yet been able to uh, guarantee a safeguard for all the homes that are burned each year by fire. The same thing with oil and natural gas. Very good... Uh, uh, and that resources to use for energizing our needs and our way of life, but yet these have not yet uh, been able to be safely uh, maintained and to be guaranteed that there would be no deaths or destruction caused on these sources of energy. Now, I just wonder uh, if this debate were <coughs> taking place back in history, if you would also be opposed to uh, 
tapping these resources of energy as you are with the nuclear problem, which of course has risks involved, but the benefits, I think, far outweigh those risks. Uh, let me answer that since you pose it to me. I think that uh, you're really trying to compare oranges and apples because you just take a look at any of the leading geneticists who are knowledgeable about radiation. They're extremely concerned about the possibility of really retrogressive evolution of species. There's Polycarpov, for example, who wrote a book called Radioecology of Aquatic Organisms. It says further radioactive contamination of the oceans is intolerable. Levels which are far below the so-called safe levels that Dr. Uh, Teller referred to have caused abnormalities in fish embryos. And he says that these are in danger of undermining the whole ocean fisheries. Moreover, the Nobel Prize winning geneticist Joshua Lederberg predicted that if the, if the population of the United States were exposed to what Dr. Teller referred to as a safe dose, that is a maximum permissible dose of radiation, that the public health burden by the year 2000 would cost about $10 billion in genetically related diseases, not counting things like stillbirths and deformities, just counting things like schizophrenia, coronary heart disease, arterial sclerosis, all the diseases that have genetic linkages. There's also carcinogenic aspects. These are low levels of radiation. What we are talking about here is the survival of life on Earth. And I would like to read a quote, if I had it ready at hand, which I don't think I don't have. Don't bother, Dr. Edwards. I think you've made your point. Dr. Teller has raised his hand. Briefly. The permitted radiation on the border of a reactor is five milliards per year. In Denver, Colorado, because the place is closer to the sky, the excess radiation, and for a few other re reasons, the excess radiation is 100 million. I will not want to criticize reactors until the 20 times more dangerous location of Denver is evacuated. <laughs> Gentlemen over here has a question. Uh, can I rebut that? No, Dr. Man behind you. Man behind you, Stan. Uh, Dr. Teller, I wonder if you would comment uh, along these same lines then on the studies that have been done in the United States uh, on low-level radiation, which have indicated dramatic increases in leukemia rates, uh, infant mortality rates, and infant defects around the nuclear reactor sites, particularly in Pennsylvania and Michigan. May I please say that they have not. There is a lot of misinformation about that, and I can continue to talk about it for a long time. How many hours do I have, Mr. Chairman? Two minutes. <laughs> In two minutes, I can do exceedingly little. But I can tell you that ethane hostesses are exposed to four times the maximum permissible dose, which in turn, is very much greater than this five million. They are exposed to 600 million. And no statistics has yet shown that these airplane hostesses are worse off. In fact, in the United States, they have won a suit for the right to work under those conditions. <laughs> Dr. Teller, I'm afraid that you're really uh, giving out misinformation here, and I think you know you are. I First am all, sure that this is not true. That you are not giving out misinformation. Well, you, you accuse me. me. You that accuse is me. not what I said. I said that if I'm giving out misinformation, I don't know that I am. Okay, well, let me explain how you are, because you have just enunciated some of the principal myths which are associated with nuclear power. First of all, that standing at the boundary of a nuclear power plant is the way you get radiation from nuclear power. It is not. The main burden of radiation from a nuclear power plant is in the food chain, as you well know. It concentrates in the food chain. How does it get there? It gets there from routine emissions from every power plant. The, it does not. The only routine emission is a Gentlemen, inert I must, gas. I must bring the argument to an end because we're coming to the end and we want to give you a chance in a moment to sum up your arguments before our audience votes. We'll be back in a moment for that summing up. See you then. Right, 45 seconds here in the great debate for the affirmative and Dr. Edward Teller. My honorable opponent has accused me in an extremely polite form of lying. <laughs> in a scientific manner, I admit I have lied in my life, in one way or the other, but never in science. I have one more thing to say to you. Of all matter known to man, 
the human brain is the most inert. I want to make a rapid prediction. None of you will have changed your mind due to this little debate. Well, we'll see. 45 seconds now for Dr. Gordon Edwards. Yes, I think people won't be able to change their mind until they get facts which they're not given. I think that what we should call for is a moratorium on the building of nuclear power plants, the setting up of an independent task force with citizen representation to look into the whole question of nuclear power plants in Canada. And I think there should be immediate research on the conservation of energy, immediate implementation of legislation. I think there should be immediate channeling of funds into alternative sources of energy which are relatively non-polluting and which can meet all our energy needs well beyond 2000, such as solar energy, which is proven, geothermal energy, gasification of coal, wind power. There are all kinds of things which the National Research of Council are presently experimenting with, but they're starved for funds. The nuclear boys have it all. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. <laughs> all right, it's time to vote. If you agree with Dr. Edward Teller, show him the green side of your cards. If you agree with Dr. Gordon Edwards, show him the red side of your cards. Cards up, please. We'll be back in a moment to tell you the results. See you then. It's the great debate from Toronto, and here's Pierre Burton to bring you the results of the vote on tonight's resolution that nuclear power plants are necessary and should be constructed. Right, when the program started, uh, Dr. Teller had 76 on his side and Dr. Edwards 20 on his side, and I told you, Dr. Teller, that made it very difficult for you. It has proved to be so. Dr. Edwards now has 60 on his side. He has changed 40 minds. You still have 36. We declare the debate won by Dr. Gordon Edwards. Congratulations, sir. Congratulations. The wrong side had won. I hope to see you tonight. That scientific lies. Now, let me tell you just briefly about next week's program. Next week's program deals with Western separatism, resolved that the West should separate from Canada. And taking the affirmative is a Western separatist, uh, Queen's Council, former head of the Progressive Conservative Party in Alberta, Mr. Milt Heritance. Opposing Western separatism, or indeed any kind of separatism, is a Quebecer, Raoul Cowette, the leader of the Federal Social Credit Party will defend the Constitution. We hope you'll all be with us when, once again next week, we stage the great debate. See you there. The next subject was resolved that nuclear power plants are necessary and should be constructed. Our debaters were Dr. Edward Teller for the affirmative and Dr. Gordon Edwards for the negative. Guests on The Great Debate stay at the Hyatt Regency, Toronto's most exciting hotel. I'm Bernard Cowan. <laughs>Toronto on a Thursday evening, I would like tickets to The Great Debate. Write to The Great Debate, Box 2200, Postal Station P, Toronto. <laughs>